So um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, maybe good evening for those attending remotely in Europe or further east like me. Um, so today um, I'm going to talk about the PLC code security from an attacker's perspective. And of course, the recent events and uh, the discovery of the in-controller or pipe dream um, ICS toolkit um, was something to consider. And so today we're going to see if by being a, a little more focused on cybersecurity during the, the PLC code development, we can protect from some at least of those attack capabilities. So uh, first, a disclaimer, and it's really, really important for me to, to, to do this disclaimer. Um, everything I'm going to say today is based on the, the hard work of a lot of people. So the topic of PLC code security, uh, I think, at least for me, it started in 2019 during the, the S4 conference. So Jake Brodsky uh, gave a very interesting presentation on how to protect from cyber attack by uh, embedded cybersecurity into the way we, we code. Uh, so the topic was then uh, picked up by Vivek and Sarah uh, with the help of uh, Dave Patterson as well and the ISA. And so they created an online platform and more than 900 people participated in the discussion to create the first top 20 of the secure coding guidelines for PLC. So uh, basically, if you like or if you're interested in what you hear today, uh, you can thank all of those people. However, this presentation expresses my own ideas and uh, I cannot guarantee that everything that I'm going to say is, uh, I would say, reflects the, the, the ideas of every participant. So basically, if you like it, uh, you can thank all of those people. And if you do not like it, you can just blame it on me. <laughs> So um, I already had a, a very nice introduction, so I think there's no need to spend too much time here. So as mentioned, I mostly do ICS cybersecurity uh, assessment, and I've done that for, uh, I would say, uh, quite a long time. So on the agenda today, uh, I will do a very, very brief introduction into PLCs. Uh, I think I have one slide. Then I will introduce what the top 20 is, of course, and we will spend then most of the time discussing a few examples on how to protect from cyber attacks by, um, I would say, applying those best practices. And finally, one or two uh, slides for the conclusions and takeaways. So PLCs, Programmable Logic Controllers. Um, I think if you're here and attending today, you've probably heard about PLC, so no need to, to, to say quite a lot. Those are, I would say, real-time digital computers used for automation. Uh, their specificity is to have a lot of analog and digital inputs and outputs, so electrical inputs and outputs. The devices are somehow rugged, so they, are, they should be immune to vibration, electrical noise, those kind of things that you may encounter in, in factories. But also, they have limited computational resources. So most of the PLCs that you will encounter, they, they are not able to do a lot of very complex cryptographic uh, calculations, for example. And basically, what a PLC does is uh, simply run an infinite loop with four main stages. The first stage is to read the electrical inputs. So the PLCs, they are wired to sensors. So first you read the values of the sensors, then you execute the logic. Logic is another term that we use to, 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 to talk about the, the code of the PLC. Depending on the result of the logic, you will write and update the values of the outputs that will control the, the actuators connected to, to the PLC. And finally, the last stage, is to perform some housekeeping operations and, of course, take care of the communication because the PLC most of the time com communicates at least with um, the supervision system, so SCADA or DCS system, and maybe with remote I.O. racks or, uh, I would say, a few other PLCs. So now that we know what PLCs are and how they operate, uh, we can wonder, you, you've probably heard about the OWASP top 10 that talks about, I would say, the top 10 risk for web applications. And before last year, we didn't have any equivalent for PLC code. And so, of course, that's a big problem. So uh, thanks again to the help of a lot of people, um, a, a document was published, the top 20, uh, I think it was last year. So you can download the full document on plc-security.com. It's a PDF uh, document. You have 20 rules. And for each of those uh, 
20 guidelines, you will have exactly the same structure. So you, you will have the title, a short description, what is the security objective of this um, coding guideline, and then you will have additional guidance. So of course, one of the issues with PLC is that each vendor has its own way of implementing uh, the, the, the programming language or the, the, the code of the PLC. So it's really difficult to have um, one guideline that is exactly applicable to all of the PLCs. I mean, even some of the vendors, they have different types of PLC. So even for just for one specific vendor, you will end up with different software to program the PLC. And so slightly different ways of applying those top 20 secure coding guidelines. So what you will see in, in this uh, presentation are examples, but they, it's not possible to just copy paste like a, a code snippet. And I know that uh, myself, when I do a bit of programming or scripting, I've, I'm very used to copy pasting uh, code from Stack Overflow. Um, it's not possible to do the same with most of the PLCs because there are some specificities to each PLC model. So what you have to understand is that the guidance will help you understand why you should implement this secure coding guideline and how to do that at a high level. But what could be interesting in the future and maybe with your help would be to define specific uh, coding guidelines applied for a specific PLC model. Okay, so that was a brief introduction to the, the top 20. Now, um, and this is my own view. That's not part of the top 20 document or official project, but the way I understand those 20 rules is the following. You have three main categories. Some uh, coding guidelines can be applied during the configuration of the PLC. So that means before developing any code. Some of course will be directly embedded in the way you program the PLC. And some of the coding guidelines mostly refer to monitoring the state of the PLC to be able to detect uh, I would say an abnormal situation that could uh, be the result of a cyber attack. Okay, so I will uh, not read all of those 20 rules, but as you can see, they are um, categorized in those three main um, categories. And I will try to show you one example, at least for each of those three categories, configuration, development, and monitoring. So that was the short introduction, and now we will uh, dive into the content. So a few examples with uh, video demonstrations. So I wanted to perform some demonstrations. So I had to create a, a very simple setup for, for that. And what I used was a Schneider Electric TM221 PLC. It's an entry-level PLC, so it's quite cheap. I would say it's sold for the, the, the entry model, maybe around 300 euros in, in France. Uh, it's actually based on codices. And in addition to that, I've added a, a simple physical process, a SCADA that communicates with the PLC, uh, as well as one attacker machine. So that's my setup for the demonstration. I want to emphasize that um, the, the choice of the PLC is, is based on the fact that I had some lying around at home and at the office. Uh, it doesn't mean that, that I endorse the product in any way, but also it doesn't mean that I disapprove of those products, okay? It's just happened to be the PLC that were in my office. So uh, I started working in, uh, um, for this presentation uh, a few months ago, and then I discovered that the Pipe Dream or In Controller Attack Toolkit that was discovered, uh, I said in May, but I think it was actually in April this year, um, was targeting uh, exactly the same PLC model as the one that I had. So I thought, well, it could be interesting to see if we can match some of the secure coding guidelines to some of the toolkit um, attack capabilities. So um, also a disclaimer, I have no specific knowledge about uh, Pipe Dream or InController. I just read uh, the white paper published by Mendiant, uh, Dragos, and Schneider Electric. And uh, I was able to see the presentation given at the, the S4 conference on the topic. So based on this uh, public information, what we can say is that there is a specific module as part of Pipe Dream that targets um, Schneider codices-based PLC, so like the TM221 that I'm using, but also uh, the TM241 uh, and a few others. 
And this toolkit, uh, so this specific component of the toolkit is called uh, by Drago's Evil Scholar. And it has the ability to do a few things. First, uh, run a scan and discover all the PLCs on the network, brute force some passwords, some denial of service, but also, and I think that's the most interesting thing, is the last bullet point on the slide on the right, is uh, the ability to perform some maintenance or administrative actions on the PLC, like logging on the PLC, downloading the program, uploading a new program, etc., cetera, et cetera. So basically, this, um, this uh, specific component of PipeDream is able to do the same thing as you can do with the engineering software for the PLC. Okay, and we will start with the, 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 the first rule I'm, I'm going to explain. It's the rule number 13. It's part of what I call the configuration. And it will seem really basic, I know, but very few people do that. It's called disable unneeded or unused communication ports and protocols. Uh, most PLCs, uh, not only the new ones, uh, but even the PLCs, I, I would say that were sold uh, 10, 15, or 20 years ago, they have a lot of features in addition to just being able to run ladder logic. Uh, so most of the time they support uh, numerous ICS protocols. So maybe Ethernet IP, um, maybe um, Modbus TCP, maybe Modbus Serial, uh, maybe OPC UA. And in addition to that, they also have additional features like web servers, telnet servers, FTP servers. And of course, the best practice as in uh, cybersecurity, even for IT, is to perform some hardening of the PLC. So that's what we will see in the, in the video. I will try to walk you through the video, and then I'll go back to this slide to, dis to discuss if this is uh, efficient to protect against evil scholar. Okay, so let's see if the video works. It seems to work. Okay, so on the top left uh, side of the video, you have my setup. So there's the power supply on the left, the PLC in the center, and on the right, uh, a simple like traffic light. And at the moment, the red light is on. On the right bottom side, you have the engineering workstation with so machine basic. That's the software used to program the PLC. And as you can see, for this specific entry level PLC, there are a few options to configure the security. So what you can enable or disable are the ICS protocols. For example, I'm going to disable Ethernet IP because I'm not using it. I'm going to keep Modbus enabled because I'm using that to, to, to discuss with the SCADA. I'm going to disable the auto discovery protocol that allows to uh, easily uh, query the PLCs on the network. And the last one is the programming protocol. So that's the one that allows you to use the software uh, that I'm using at the moment over the network to program the PLC. Uh, so of course, it's not easy to just disable that. <laughs> we will discuss that. So now I will go to the commissioning tab of the software. And um, of course, I cannot use the network to disable the network connection. So first, what I'm going to do is plug the USB cable to be able to reprogram the PLC without using the network. So that's happening at the moment. I'm plugging the USB cable. Then the PLC will show up in the local devices. I can then log into the PLC. And once I'm logging uh, to the PLC, I can download the code. So that means sending the code from the laptop to the PLC. I know it's a bit different than from IT, but that's what we call download. And so now the PLC has been updated. I've disabled the auto discovery, the Ethernet IP protocol, and I have also disabled the programming protocol. So now I will start the PLC. PLC code is very simple. It says to uh, switch the first output all the time, switch to on. And now I will unplug the USB cable and try to connect the P to the PLC using the, the, the network. And of course, as you would expect, it will not work. Okay. I'm logged out of the PLC. I will unplug the USB cable. Okay, and now if I try to log in, it's going to take a while and 
it will fail in the end. So uh, I will probably cut the video now to, to, to gain a few seconds, but you get the idea. So let's go back one slide and let's discuss how this is efficient. So the first thing, disabling the auto discovery, well, it's easy to do, no problem, but it also has very limited impacts. I mean, there are a ton of other ways to discover PLCs on the network. So even if that's part of the recommendation of Schneider Electric, I'm not so sure it's really efficient, but you can easily do it. What could be very efficient is disabling the programming protocol, because as you remember, Evil Scholar is able to do a lot of the features that the, the official software from Schneider is able to do. So it will prevent most of the advanced attack, like the attacker trying to reprogram the PLC to bypass some of the security features. But it's not always realistic, because as you've seen, it means you have to go near the PLC, plug the USB cable. So it's quite a burden for, for, for the people doing that. Uh, this is an entry level PLC, so you do not have the key switch that you may have on higher end PLCs that allow you to, to physically decide if you want to enable the connection or not. On this PLC, you just have to disable in the software and then go using your USB cable. So first, uh, very simple, very basic, but very efficient rule is to perform some hardening on the PLC, especially disabling what you do not absolutely need. Okay, so now we will switch to the a different category. The next one is development. So some rules that you will have to use while programming the PLC. Um, I will talk about two different rules that are very, I would say, very much linked. Uh, the first one is the rule number six that says that you have to validate timers and counters. By the way, what's displayed on the left side of the slide is directly a, a screenshot from the top 20 document that I mentioned. Um, so of course, if uh, you have some timers or counter va values that are written to the PLC, you need to check if those values are realistic and especially if the, those values are higher than zero because it doesn't make sense to have a timer uh, that's less than zero. And the second one, the rule number eight is very similar and very linked. It says to validate HMI inputs at the PLC level, not only at the HMI level. So really, it means that when you take a value on the PLC, you should perform a few sanity checks to make sure that the value is realistic. Again, we will take a look at the video, and then I will go back to this slide to discuss how efficient uh, to protect against attacks this could be. So we have the same setup. As you can see, it's, this was at the office. The previous one, previous one was at home, I think. And I will walk you through the code of the PLC. At the moment, it's a very simple code. When I switch the timer uh, value to on, it will copy the value of the timer to the timer and then switch the first output to, to one, to on. So that means the, la the, the lamp will be on. At this time, if the lamp is on, the timer will start. And once the timer is finished, I will reset the value of the lamp. So the lamp will be switched off and the, 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 the value of the timer start variable will be reset to zero as well. So let's take a look. Here I'm using the, the SCADA. I will try to set the value of the timer. Let me zoom in, okay. So if I try to input any value like 1000, it's not gonna work because here I implemented some boundaries for this value as part of the SCADA. If I input four seconds, it works. Then I click on start. The lamp will be switched on for four seconds, then back to off. Okay, very simple. So now what happens if you have an attacker on the network and he's trying to directly communicate with the PLC without using the SCADA? So that's what you will see on the bottom left side of the screen. Um, this is a Kali Linux machine. I'm using MBT get. It's a very simple Modbus client. So first I'm connecting to the device and I'm trying to perform some uh, read queries to read the values of the registers. It's quite easy to identify the, 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 the value of the timer because it's a simple example. So only a few registers are used. In real life, it would be much harder. But let's say I identify that it's the first register that's used to uh, store the duration of the timer. 
I can try to write to this value and Modbus being Modbus, uh, it's possible to do that without any kind of authentication. So the only prerequisite is to be on the network. Let's say I try to write 20,000. So the command line says, okay. And I know it's not easy to see, but here on the engineering workstation, you can see that the value has been received. So the boundaries from the SCADA are not, uh, I would say, um, are not followed by the, the PLC because the PLC doesn't know about the boundaries. They're only implemented on the SCADA side. So now let's try something even higher, 65,000. And now we have a problem because we have an overflow of the, uh, the, the value because now the value is so high that the PLC considers that the value is negative. So minus 500 and, and something. So what happens if I'm trying to start the timer with a duration of minus 500? Well, let's take a look. The lamp is switched to on. And the timer doesn't change. So what will happen at this time, I believe, is that um, the timer will never end. So of course, here it's a simple lamp. That's not a major issue. But as you can imagine, for some other use cases in the process, that might be bad. So here, I'm just stopping the PLC to easily stop the timer. And I will try to modify the code to follow the best practices number six and eight and implement some uh, specific sanity checks on the PLC code. So again, on, with this example, it's quite easy. Uh, I will do two things. The first one is to check that the value uh, of the timer is higher than zero. So here I simply input timer duration is higher than zero. And the other one is to have also, um, I would say, a higher bound. And this doesn't have to be the same boundaries as in the SCADA, because I understand that in an industrial process, you may want to change your set points. And so you do not want to modify the code of the PLC every time. But you may want to have a high value that's a limit and that makes sense from a physical perspective. Okay, we have to remember that the PLC controls a physical process. And for example, if this timer, it doesn't make sense to be, uh, I would say longer than one minute, then you should take one minute as a high boundary, even if the SCADA only allows, for example, 30 seconds. So let's start the PLC again with this new code. Okay, and now we can see that if we change, if we go back to the, the SCADA and we try to launch the sequence, it's not gonna work for the simple reason that the value is considered lower than zero. And so we are protected. Okay, so let's go back on this slide. So what's, uh, the, what's, what's the use case here? So none of these rules will actually prevent uh, any cyber attack. But in the case of a cyber attack, these rules will prevent, uh, I would say, a negative impact on the process. So if you have an attacker on the network, the attacker is not able to modify the PLC code, for example, because we follow the rule number 13. And then the attacker is still able to send to fuzz some values to the Modbus registrars trying to disrupt the process. But at least if we follow these uh, development guidelines, we know that the attacker will not harm the process. So I think it's really important. It allows to, 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 to really lower the, the, the possible impact of an attack. Okay, perfect. Um, let's continue with the last category, PLC monitoring for cybersecurity. And I think that if you attended um, the, the, the summit yesterday, uh, this will probably look uh, quite familiar because it's, uh, um, it's the same idea that uh, Gloria mentioned in the, her talk yesterday, I think. So basically that means we want to leverage operational data to identify potential cyber related events. So, you can call that a poor man uh, cybersecurity detection, if you want. And here again, being a, a cybersecurity consultant, I identify three categories. I don't know why, but I always think about three categories, then three subcategories. Well, the first thing we can, um, we can monitor is 
uh, the version, so version control. That means knowing um, what version of the firmware is running on the PLC, but also um, knowing if the application changes. I think that's a major topic. The second thing we can monitor is the controller state. By controller, I mean PLC. So we could check a few things. I'll dive into the details uh, later, but basically making sure that the PLC is running correctly and, it, and that the PLC is not stopped. Lastly, um, we can monitor a few things uh, related to the, the cycle times and the errors on the PLC. Uh, so we can take a look at what's the uptime of the PLC and investigate if the PLC is rebooting all the time, for example. Um, as well as monitoring the memory usage or the last cycle time. So that means the time required by the PLC to complete uh, its four stage loop that I discussed at the beginning of the, the presentation. And so we can also say that if the, the, the cycle time is changing, probably there's something wrong or at least something to investigate. Again, I can tell you right away, those rules will not prevent any cyber attack, but they could allow operators to identify an abnormal situation. And after investigation, maybe you can identify a cyber attack. So I think that's why it's so interesting. So let's start with uh, the version control. No, the controller state, sorry. So again, on the left side of the slide, you have uh, the, 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 the extract from the top 20. So here we want to track the operating modes of the PLC. So the PLC, uh, so the TM221 from Schneider Electric, as well as most of the PLCs, they have different mode. Uh, so they can be run, they, sorry, they could be running, they could be stopped, uh, they could be halted. So there's a, a few ways the PLC can, can behave. And on the right side of the slide, you have an extract from the, the user manual. So, you know, cybersecurity is often, oftentimes, and pen testing as well, it's uh, oftentimes it's, uh, it's about reading the manual and understanding what the product can do. So that's what I did. And as you can see, there is a specific system word, SW6, that contains the current state of the PLC. So what I did is to develop some ladder logic to copy this internal value to a Modbus register that I can then monitor using the SCADA. Okay, so let's take a look at the video. As you can see on the right side, I develop a new view for my uh, SCADA HMI that's called PLC monitoring on which you have um, a, a few information. The first one being PLC status. And as you can see, there's a, a, a large green dot um, next to, to PLC status. That means that the PLC is running at the moment. Okay, so here with the SCADA, I just launched a new sequence uh, for 15 seconds. And now I'm just gonna stop the PLC. So that's a legitimate feature uh, that, that you can use to, to stop the PLC. As you can see, the uh, SCADA HMI has not been updated. Why? Because when you stop the PLC, PLC is still on the network. PLC still answers to the, um, I would say to the Modbus queries from the SCADA, but the values are not um, updated anymore. So being able to see that there is a red dot and an alarm that the PLC status is stopped, I think it's really, really quite interesting. And that allows the operators to know that what they see on the HMI screen might not be the reality of the process. And I think that's really important and not only for cybersecurity. Arnaud, just a five minute warning. And for anybody who has questions, go ahead and put those in the hallway chat so we can follow up after. I have, I'll have a whole one question for you, carry on. Okay, I continue. I'll probably skip the last video because of the timing, but this will be published, so no worries. Second thing I want to emphasize is um, on the legitimate um, uh, engineering software, you can also force the value of the outputs. What does that mean? It's used mostly for commissioning. You can bypass the PLC code and try to force the value on or off, for example, of the outputs. Uh, so of course, that's quite interesting when you want to, to test your wiring, but that also means that um, what you see again on the SCADA HMI might not be the reality because the value of the outputs is forced. So here you can see the code that I developed basically is again, is just about uh, copying internal values to, um, 
to not boost registers. Okay, so here, as you can see, IO forced is red. So that means that the operator knows that somebody is forcing the value of the PLC. And so what you can see, what the, the operator can see on the SCADA screen is not the reality. And I think that's really, really important. Okay, so I will go quick on, on the next one, version control. It's about making sure that you do a good change control. So again, I simply copy some value from the PLC to a Modbus register. In this case, SW94 and 95, which are values that contain uh, an uh, um, um, application signature. So that's a checksum of the PLC code. So again, let's take a quick look. So as you can see here, the firmware version is 1.6. And that's also quite interesting, being able to monitor the firmware version, even just for inventory reasons. You can easily query using Modbus the firmware version of the PLC. So I think that's, that's also a win. Um, and then you have the application signature. It's 7472 in this specific case. And here I'm just showing that if I remove some of the code, this will modify the PLC code. And then you can also raise an alarm. As an operator, I know it's not my job, but I, I would be happy to know that somebody has modified the way the PLC works. I think that's, uh, Again, it's not only about cybersecurity, but also about change management and making sure that um, people in charge of the process know what's going on. So here I just removed the two additional checks that I used before. And as you can see, the application signature has changed and I raised an alarm that, that has been logged. So also in case of incidents, you can know that somebody has modified the program of the PLC. Okay, since I'm running uh, slightly late, I will uh, just bypass this one cycle time. You can check the video later on if you want, and I will switch over to the conclusion. So first, let me be very clear. I'm not saying that operators must be in charge of watching another screen in real time with cybersecurity uh, issues. Absolutely not. Operators are in charge of monitoring and controlling the process. That's a full-time job, and they they shouldn't be um, they shouldn't have uh, I mean a, a security operational center a hat in addition to their hard hat. Absolutely not. I'm also convinced that PLC code security is not sufficient to prevent attacks on ICS environment. That's one more thing you can do, one more thing in your toolbox to secure the process, but absolutely not sufficient. What are the real takeaways? The PLC code can have a real impact on the cybersecurity of a system, and that includes limiting the impact and detecting in controller or pipe dream toolkit uh, activities. Uh, this is based, of course, on the theory. Uh, I'm, I, was, uh, I didn't test it in real life, but as you can see, most of the attack features could be detected or prevented. I also believe that PLC code security best practices, they can also contribute to the quality and safety of the process, not only the cybersecurity. And lastly, and most important, that's really a great topic to empower automation engineers and to show that cybersecurity, it's not just an IT thing. Cybersecurity is not only about installing, you know, network probes, firewalls, and blinking boxes. It's really something that everyone has to care about, even automation engineers, and you can do cybersecurity at the core of automation, that means inside of the PLC code. So uh, what can you do today if you want to help on the top 20 uh, topic? So first, if you're an automation engineer, well, download and read the top 20, see if you could implement that in your environment. And of course, we would welcome your participation in the community for translation, implementation guide for specific vendors, etc. If you're an asset owner, you can mention the topic to your automation engineers and add the top 20 as a requirement during procurement. I think that could be quite interesting. As a system integrator, again, uh, spread the knowledge, train your automation engineers, and maybe try to use that as a business differentiator by saying to your clients, well, in this project, we can follow the top 20 rules. We are trained on that topic, and that means a safer process for you. And lastly, if you're an automation vendor, Make sure the top 20 is applicable to your product and maybe publish some implementation guidelines on how to do that. 
And this will conclude my presentation. Last slide, if you want to play with the environment I showed during the demonstration, I have a virtual version. And if you send me an email at the address that's displayed, and I will copy paste that into the Slack channel, um, I can give you a link that will give you uh, access to the virtual environment for 24 hours. Um, so that could be interesting. But you can also check our GitHub for all the, the project files if you want to replicate that in your own environment. Thanks a lot uh, for your attention.